Serving 875,000 people, Island Health's focus is the health and wellness of the residents and communities on Vancouver Island and in surrounding coastal communities. Our diverse geography spans 48 settler communities and 50 First Nations, from the Zawadinu people of Kincomb Inlet to Victoria, from Tofino to Comox. We acknowledge with respect and gratitude our privilege to provide health and care services on the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish, Kwakwakiwak, and New Chalneth cultural families. The Island Health family includes 27,000 healthcare professionals and 1,000 dedicated volunteers. 2,900 doctors, nurse practitioners, midwives, and dentists make up our medical staff. We provide health and care services at 145 facilities with more than 6,600 long-term care beds, nearly 1,400 mental health and substance use beds, and more than 1,800 acute care and rehabilitation beds. Island Health has an annual budget of $3 billion. Each year, this funding supports 491,000 visits to emergency departments, more than 73,000 surgeries, 59,000 MRIs, 152,000 CT scans, 2,100 telehealth visits, more than 51,000 visits to urgent and primary care centers, over 16,000 home health monitoring visits, and 463,000 home health care visits each year. Island Health has expanded our primary care services with seven Island Health urgent and primary care centers, and we partner in three community health centers and seven primary care networks across the region with further expansion in the works. Under the leadership of six medical health officers, Island Health works to promote health, prevent disease, and improve quality of life. Each year, we conduct more than 2,000 inspections of childcare facilities, 600 inspections of licensed care facilities, and 4,500 inspections of food service operations. Public health nurses provide more than 5,000 perinatal home care visits, and in partnership with First Nations Health Authority and community pharmacies, more than 2 million COVID vaccines have been provided in Island Health. From before birth to end of life, Island Health strives to provide excellent health and care for everyone, everywhere, every time. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Leah Hollins, the chair of the board of directors of Island Health. It feels to me like there's a big sound in here. Is that true? Okay, but that's all right? Okay. On behalf of my colleagues, welcome to our public forum. Whether you are joining us in person here at the Couch and Tribe Siam Leelam Gymnasium in Duncan or online through our live stream, I acknowledge with respect and humility the traditional unceded territories of the Couch and Tribes and the neighboring nations of Halalt, Lyaxon, Penalicut, and Shemanus. I'm so grateful to introduce council member and elder Albie Joe Charlie of the Couch and Tribes to start our meeting with a welcoming message. Albie? First of all, I welcome you all here 
sitting together, standing together, and sharing your voices together towards better understanding, towards the needs of our people. On behalf of chief and council members of the culture and tribe, I welcome you. It's been a hard struggle for the past three years because we've been isolated and separated from a lot of the work that we need to do. But today we're moving forward again and working together. And I really thank each one of you. And you know, I, I really thank my friends for coming to share. Share what you need to share to improve the services that we need. This is actually the third meeting for them. So they were working very hard. They started at Coltrane Bay, eight o'clock this morning, then to the elders building, who just finished there, and now they're here to complete that work. So I really, really thank them. And at the, at the beginning, when I opened with a prayer, I ask for direction. For this prayer, I'm going to give thanks for this unity of working together. And, you know, I really welcome again each one of you, and it's good to see my, my friend. Well, she's a friend sometime. Mayor, <laughs> culture. Hi, Chika. Thank you so much, Albie. I've learned as I've gotten to know Albie over time that he's a very wise man. And I really appreciate your wisdom and for you being here again with us today. Thank you. I raise my hands in gratitude for you uh, um, offering us a, a prayer and a welcome so that we can, as visitors, live, work, and care within your unceded traditional territory. Thank you so much. I want to acknowledge, too, that we serve the communities of Malahat, to Subaset and Dididat, and we recognize the Inuit, the away from home urban indigenous people, and the Metis chartered community. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving relationships between nations and to cultivating our own understanding of indigenous peoples and cultures. Please join me in reflecting on the harms done such as the cultural genocide and assimilations of indigenous people, the residential school system and discovery of graves of indigenous children who attended them, the too many missing and murdered indigenous women and children, and the social inequalities and racism that exist today. I invite you to think about the responsibility we each have in a spirit of reconciliation healing and collaboration. As a healthcare organization, Island Health is committed to cultural safety and humility, and we demonstrate this through our actions to address indigenous specific racism, systemic racism, and the ongoing impacts of colonialism. Public forums like this allow the board to meet the people and communities we serve, 
and are essential to our commitment to transparency and accessibility. Our time together will help us better see what matters most to you so we can increase our understanding and refine our thinking. Don't be afraid to sit in the front row. It's okay. <laughs> As a governance board, we are responsible for the overall direction of Island Health. The Minister of Health appoints the board, but we each choose to sit on the board because we care deeply about health and care. As a former nurse, Deputy Minister of Health, and Chair of Canadian Blood Services, the patient has always been central to my work. I always ask myself, is what I am doing right for the patient? Because caring for the patient is why I started working in healthcare and why I continue to support the delivery of health and care. Caring is also why every member of the Island Health family is dedicated to delivering Island Health's vision of providing excellent health and care for everyone, everywhere, every time. I now want to take the opportunity, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to our Board of Directors, who are responsible, as I mentioned earlier, for the overall direction of Island Health. The board consists of nine directors. In addition to myself, the board includes Ron Rice, a member of the Couch and Tribes who lives in Victoria. Uh, missing from our table this afternoon because she had to leave early was, is Shawnee Cassavant from Hupetchaset and Seishot First Nations on the West Coast. And I want to welcome our newest member of the board, Andy Adams from Campbell River. Also, we have Diane Brennan from Nanaimo, Ann Davis from the Comox Valley, Ann McFarlane from, it says Victoria, but Ann actually lives in Saanichton. I heard you say that earlier. Ron Matson from View Royal. And unfortunately, one of our board members is off ill and couldn't be here today. Her name is Alana Nast and she lives in Victoria. We also have some local leadership and executive management teams joining us and you will hear from them later this afternoon. We do have a very full program as we always seem to do when we're at these public forums. Dr. Shannon Waters, medical health officer, will speak about public health and wellness in the region. We will then have presentations on the Couch and Health and Care Plan and the Village Project, which Michelle raised this morning at our partnership breakfast a supportive housing project managed by Lookout Housing in partnership with Island Health. The last part of the agenda will be an opportunity for you, community members, who have come to our meeting and or, and or submitted questions by email in advance. So I will open the floor to questions so the board can hear from you. But first off, I'd like to introduce Island Health's president and CEO, Kathy McNeil, who will begin by providing an update on the delivery of health and care services across Vancouver Island, and in particular here in the Couch and Valley. Kathy? Thank you, Leah. I feel a bit um, of an imposter to speak to the work here in Cowich and Valley, because so many people here in this room could teach me a bit about uh, the great work that's happening here. I want to extend my thanks to uh, Elder Albi as well, who has been so gracious. I feel like you've spent the whole day with us, Albi. <laughs> so I don't know how much time you've had for other things, but you've been walking alongside us all day today and just want to thank you for being here and opening us up in a good way. And I do want to thank the uh, hospitality of the Cowichan tribes on whose land we're meeting and who are also allowing us to use this beautiful space for our meeting today. Uh, very generous of, of them to uh, allow us to meet here. I also want to just recognize, as Lisa, Leah has, the, the eight First Nations who we serve in this region, region, as well as the Inuit, other First Nations from across Canada who live here in Cowichan Valley, and the Métis Charter community who are, who are based here in uh, Duncan. 
I just want to take a moment to extend my heartfelt sympathy on the tragic death of Carson Seaweed here in this community and many other loved ones and community members who's all, who have also lost their, lost their lives due to tragic circumstances. And we know the toxic drug crisis is having that kind of impact in every community across Vancouver Island, including Couch and Valley. I recognize the heaviness and the grief that the community is experiencing from these losses and offer our condolences to the families and to the community who are impacted. I'm grateful to be here today. We've had a, an awesome, very full day here in Duncan. And for the people who are here this afternoon, and for those of you who are joining virtually, thank you so much for spending your time with us. This morning we started with a breakfast with community partners where we had a, quite a great discussion focused on the work that's been happening here on the Cowichan Health and Care Plan, which was commissioned in 2018 as a sister project to the redevelopment of the Cowichan District Hospital. And I know at tables we, what we heard from partners were the conversations about how uh, Island Health can support the work that's happening here in the community and making sure that we communicate all of the great initiatives and connect people to those initiatives uh, where they need help and services. Um, we discussed the value of community partnerships that have led to the detailed design and delivery of the integrated work of the community services marrying up with a new hospital the collaboration that's here within Cowichan Valley, um, the role that the Community Health Network plays as being the convener of the many partners who are in this work, and how Cowichan uh, as a community is coming together to tackle the health in inequalities in the outcomes, experience, and access to care. The Cowichan Health and Care Plan has established a roadmap for strengthening and integrating health services to address gaps, and try, remove some of the barriers that exist that um, are getting in the way of achieving better health. We're on track through targeted uh, community investments using data, using the population health needs analysis uh, to prevent over 7,000 uh, hospital days by 2025 and 12,000 of those days in, by 2035 by providing enhanced services in the community. You'll see a presentation from uh, Donna Joanne Tapp, our project director for the Cowichan Health and Care Plan shortly, and I don't want to steal any of her thunder, but I do want to recognize just a couple of successes of the plan. In January of 2021, the short-term enablement and planning suites or what we lovingly refer to as the STEPS program, uh, opened up with six beds in an assisted living. And this summer, it's been expanded to 10 beds to meet demand for service. And this is a program where patients who might be in hospital awaiting placement in long-term care have an opportunity to uh, experience living in a more independent way, and we can see what the true functional capabilities are. Uh, uh, so that they're not languishing in a hospital bed and are able to live in an assisted living uh, environment supported by community health services. I'm very proud of this team, proud to say in 2022, the STEPS program received a prestigious national award called the 3M Healthcare Quality Team Award. Through the Cowichan Health and Care Plan and building on the success of STEPS, We've created a new community health service program, the COPD, Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease Program. It was launched here in November of 2021 and now has the highest referral and visit rates for respiratory services on Vancouver Island. This team was recently recognized with a, a, a Island Health Evidence Into Practice Award and a Celebration of Excellence Award, a Beyond Care of Special Merit. I know Donna's presentation will speak to more details of this exciting work, and while we're here, I'd like to publicly acknowledge Donna for her leadership in this very important work and, and creating the path that we need for the future. 
We know that this community, like many communities across the island, are facing challenges when it comes to access to care. People are waiting too long in our emergency departments to see a doctor. Same goes for diagnostics, for surgeries, for specialized treatments. And despite these challenges, I know staff, physicians, other members of the healthcare team here at Cowichan District Hospital are working tirelessly to try and deliver the best health and care possible. The average emergency department wait time to be seen by a physician at, at CDH is 108 minutes, so that's almost just under two hours, just below other island health emergency department waits of an average of 110 minutes. So we know that's too long, and we're working hard to make sure that we have services in the community, and we'll talk a little bit in a, in a moment about some of the primary care supports. I also want to recognize the surgical staff and physicians at Cowichan District Hospital. In this past year, 22-23, they completed 5,931 surgeries. That was almost 20% more than the year previous. A big part of this success is because of the expansion of cataract procedures at the hospital. We know we have a lot of work ahead to improve access to surgical programs, but here at Cowichan District Hospital, they have some of the secret sauce. They're working through what they can do to improve their efficiency. I'd also like to commend Dr. Graham Blackburn, who's the Chief of Staff and Site Medical Director, and Dr. Maki Ikimura, for the work that they're doing with the staff and the physicians to improve and drive us to our vision of excellent uh, health and care here in Cowichan Valley. Co construction of the new 204 bed hospital started in January and it's now in full swing. And it's anticipated to be ready for patient care in the spring of 2027. You can see the progress we're already making clearing the site with concrete foundations now being poured. The new hospital will be three times bigger than the current one and will include a range of new services and increased capacity among many other enhancements when it opens in 2027. I know the team was out in the foyer showing plans and pictures and mock-ups and you can learn more about the new hospital by visiting our website at islandhealth.ca slash new CDH. And for those of you here in person today, please stop by and, and talk to our team. I'd, I'd like to thank the Cowichan District Hospital Foundation, who are our partners in currently raising funds for the new hospital, while also raising funds to ensure we can continue today in our current environment to serve people while we're constructing the new hospital. The foundation recently collaborated with three of the area auxiliaries to pr purchase advanced mammography equipment for CDH. This state-of-the-art equipment is the first of its kind on Vancouver Island and will help thousands of patients as early detection is key in the fight against breast cancer. I want to acknowledge the importance of our foundations in each community across the island. Your foundations enable us to have the up-to-date new and replacement equipment, and for their contributions, we are really grateful. As Leah said, it's vital that Indigenous patients and families always feel welcome, heard, and safe, and that the services we provide are culturally safe. Our engagement with Indigenous communities led to eight recommendations for a culturally safe hospital here in Cowichan and the creation of an Indigenous Advisory Committee to help us ensure our new hospital provides safe care for everyone. A research partnership with Cowichan Tribes and First Nation Health Authority is trying to discover why preterm birth, uh, birth rates are three times more likely uh, for women in Cowichan Tribes and how to reduce these high rates so that babes and mums are healthy. A community of practice for leaders who are advancing service delivery and providers who care for Indigenous people has been established by the Cowichan Primary Care Network, 
where biannual education uh, gatherings take place. This group has hosted meetings that explore Indigenous healing, the residential school findings, and this year will focus on Métis Nation health needs and trauma-informed care. Working together and ensuring voices of Indigenous people guide, shape, and inform the work today and into the future is part of our commitment to addressing Indigenous-specific racism and cultural safety and humility, key recommendations in the In Plain Sight report. We know another challenge for this that this community faces involves mental health and substance use. Like in many other communities, pe people facing these challenges here in the Cowichan Valley are, are from here and we want to support them in their own home community. We've been working with partners on new and expanded services to help. For example, we work collaboratively to provide addictions medicine, primary care, and outreach services in the same space with Lookout Health and Housing. We also work with supportive housing sites like the Village Project, who you'll hear from shortly, to provide mental health and substance use services. We've embedded community response services in the emergency department at the hospital to support clinical assessment and recommendations for people experiencing mental health and substance use challenges. We've made enhancements to the assertive community treatment or the ACT team here in Cowichan Valley, which allows us to provide services to people in smaller surrounding communities. And in Duncan, a new ACT team has been implemented, which has bolstered the existing team. This team is made up of 10 full-time nurses, social workers, peer workers, psychiatric rehab workers, and others who work as a multidisciplinary team to deliver complex mental health and substance use treatment, rehabilitation, and support. The enhancements to all of the outreach teams over the past few years have provided greater opportunity to cover the areas from the top of the Malahat to Shemanus, Lady Smith and the surrounding region. The teams have been able to deliver care to people by supporting them in their community. Some of the services provided by our outreach teams include primary care outreach, access to harm reduction, referrals for treatment and recovery, access and support to complete housing applications, and help for, with applying for jobs and integrating within the community. The Cowichan Primary Care Network began implementation in April of 2020 and is in year three of implementation. The initial phase focused primarily on attachment of people who didn't have a family doctor, and a clinic was established to assist with this in Central Duncan and a satellite clinic in Lake Cowichan. Since the time of opening and across Cowichan, over 6,500 people have been attached to a primary care provider. Right now, there are 81 family physicians in the Cowichan Valley. We are working with the Cowichan Valley Dis Division of Family Practice and the local primary care network to help attract more physicians to this region. This includes helping finding housing and supports for physicians looking to move to the area. The next phase of the implementation is focused on strengthening care in the existing family physician offices, and this has gone very well with the introduction of 13 social workers into the community. Every pr family practice clinic in the Cowichan Valley now has access to social worker supports. These social workers play a vital role in addressing social determinants of health concerns that Im impact much of our population, and the introduction of this service has already made positive changes for patients and is appreciated by the primary care providers. I will say we heard this morning that uh, people aren't aware of how to register for a family doctor if they don't have one, so I'll just put a public service announcement out there. There is a provincial website called the Health Connect Registry, and if you're looking for a family doctor, there's a way to put your name and information on that registry on the website, and they do pull people off because I got a call about three months ago, so they are taking people from that website. So uh, if you're looking, that's a good place to make sure that your name is, is registered. 
At Island Health, you heard, our vision is to provide excellent health and care for everyone, everywhere, every time. And we know we're not there. We acknowledge that the current challenges we experience in delivering services sometimes makes this vision seem very far away. It continues to serve, though, as our North Star and a common vision that brings our teams together. We work to create healthier, stronger communities and a better quality of life for those people that we serve. Our incredible teams here in Couch and Valley and across the island are dedicated to caring for their community and to rising to the challenges that are before them. We've talked today to many people, and this is a, a common theme that we've heard. The path to achieving our vision is the one that we have to walk together, inside our organization, across silos and departments, and across organizations, because we're all in service to the people who need us. It takes local collaboration and partnership to address the challenging issues that we face, because it's at the local level that we can make the greatest difference. I want to thank you for being here today and for those of you online and for uh, letting us share the work we're doing in health and care and for your interest in your community. I, I personally want to thank you for your continued support of our teams here in the Cowichan Valley. And I'd like to hand back to Leah. Thank you so much, Kathy. And now I am very pleased to introduce our medical health officer, Dr. Shannon Waters, who's here today to provide an update in health and wellness of the population in the Cowichan Valley. Dr. Waters. Hi, Chikata Leah, and I also want to say hi, Chikata Albi, for uh, the opening. Um, as was described earlier, my name is Shannon Waters. I squail. It's really nice to see you all. And I am the medical health officer for what is known as the Cowichan Valley region. I am also Hulkamitnam. I am from Stamanus First Nation and have a lot of family ties to Cowichan tribes as well. So it is an honor, privilege, and challenge to be holding this type of role in my own home territory. And I'll be sharing a few words here this afternoon about how we're doing collectively in the Cowichan Valley. And I'm pointing at Tyler to change my slides in case you're wondering. Um, so Kathy McNeil talked about data when she was sharing earlier. And data is one of the ways that we can um, know how we're doing as a population. I used to work here as a family doctor. And I would use, I would talk to a patient. And then I would also have things like blood work or x-rays that I could use to help inform me, along with talking with someone, about how they were doing. As a medical health officer, I'm st I still talk to people, but my lab work is really data about our population. And so we can get data from different places, from waiting times in emergency rooms, or we can also collect different types of data. Sometimes that's more difficult. It's not out there in the system generally. And we have a real opportunity here in the Couch and Valley in the coming months for a survey, what's called Our Health, Our Community, that Island Health is working with our couch and people here today, including Jennifer Jones on our um, advisory committee and rolling this out. And why this is a great opportunity is that it will be a way to collect local level data on our health and wellness needs here locally in the Couch and Valley. It is only for residents 18 and above, but as you'll see in some of the slides I share later, we try and collect information from people who are answering about child health in our community. We hope to have about 4,500 respondents across uh, the region. We did roll out something similar to this before I was here as a medical health officer through the R. Couch and Community Health Network. That time they got about 400 responses, and they were mostly from women, I think, in the ages of 45 to 55. Um, given that I'm in that cohort, I'm like, yay, for women going out and answering that survey, but it's not really a, a full picture of our community health. And um, really what we want to do is look at, you know, what's going on with our health status and equities to help us support local decision making and the goal is to share this data for people to use it locally in the many projects and amazing things we have going on in the valley. 
And I'll share um, about three areas I think are of importance in health within the Couch and Valley through talking to people and through data. And I'll share a bit about these three areas and some of the data. Um, it was already mentioned earlier about the toxic drug crisis. And I want to acknowledge the, this graph here um, speaks to deaths that have occurred in our community. I want to acknowledge that these may be loved ones or peoples in your family or people that you know. So just taking a moment to acknowledge that. This shows the number of deaths we've had in this region, so the Cowichan Valley region as a whole, from January 1st of 2015 to May 31st of this year. So this is the most recent data we have for the valley. And what you might see in the second to last row, that's 2022. Unfortunately, we had the highest number of deaths we've had throughout the time of this crisis in the Cowichan Valley last year. So we had 40 deaths last year. We have had so far up until May 31st, 13 deaths. And I want to acknowledge right now we actually have um, a drug poisoning alert right now in the Cowichan Valley. And that is based on information we get from the coroner, from BC Ambulance Services, and from our partners at the overdose prevention site. So certainly something we're very actively in and impacted by. Next slide. Oh, I think we've got to go back one. Oh, there should be a question slide. Can you go forward one more? All right. Um, so if you go back to the toxic drug crisis slide, um, we have within the Our Health, Our Community survey a number of questions, which I was going to have a slide that I would read off of, that are um, asking specifically around things with regards to um, substance use in our community. So there's questions that are going to be asked around, do you or someone in your family use substances? And there's going to be questions specifically around alcohol use as well, as alcohol is something that is not often maybe talked about uh, within the broader health policy areas, but it definitely is something that is having an impact on our health here in the Couch and Valley and across the whole region. Next slide. So this is looking a bit at some of our uh, child health in the community. These are data that come from um, the SPEAK survey. So this was a survey that many people in the Couch and Valley contributed to. Um, there was two rounds, and these came out while we were going through the COVID pandemic together. And this was a question asked to um, parents about what child health might be, uh, parents and other caregivers, about what child health might have been like in the home. And what I'll share here is that we have concerning numbers. Over 85% of home, homes were saying children were experiencing more stress. Um, we had over 50% of people saying children are experiencing impaired learning, and particularly in the Cowichan Valley South region, which is where we are right now, that was even higher at 64%. And the, the last um, bar here showing us people having less connections with friends, something that Albie spoke to um, in his opening. Um, everywhere reported 89 to 97% of families saying their children were having less connection with friends. So these all play a big factor in mental, emotional health. And there will be questions within the survey, which are um, looking at, again, things around child health, um, you know, again, how, how children are doing in the home and um, just other aspects around um, engagement in school and other activities in our community. Next slide. This is the last uh, um, slide around data from our community that I'll share, and this is looking at susceptibility to heat. This is something I've been very involved with recently as a, a medical health officer, and I also play a regional role with regards to climate change um, and emergency management. And we're coming into another summer season and have already had some really hot weather, including um, a, an extended period in May. This is looking at how we are as a community in being susceptible to heat. And um, here you can see um, these are looking at the different community health service areas across uh, what we know as the Cowichan Valley Regional District. And the last bars that are in dark blue are people who are 65 years of age and older. And what this data from Statistics Canada is showing us is between um, 
20 to 42% of individuals 65 years and older are susceptible to heat. So that's something with projects here in the Cowichan Valley, like our Elder um, and our EPIC project, we can reach out, connect with individuals, see if they have supports when we know heat is going on. And we have other initiatives that have come forward recently, just um, earlier this week, um, a provincial announcement around funding for air conditioners. I will say within the Our Health, Our Community survey, there will also be questions around things around climate change, including questions about how people might be feeling, um, especially youth in the home, with regards to what we're hearing, what's going on with our climate. As we know, that can be quite distressing. Next slide. I want to acknowledge that one of our uh, big impacts across the island and in this region with regards to climate change is drought. And actually, just this morning, and we're not even at the end of the June, we have passed to now drought level four, which means we are having adverse impacts. I know we have low levels in the Coxsila River and the Cowichan River, and a lot of concern um, at community level what that means to our relatives, the salmon. This is showing how drought was impacting our region over the summer of 2022, and we got to the highest level, level five, um, for the whole of the island in the early fall, and that's where adverse impacts are almost certain. We saw pictures from across the province of what some of that impact looked like, and unfortunately, we are well on our way to be at that point much earlier in the year than we were last year. Last year on, um, um, in June at this time, we were in a, in a much lower area of um, level of drought. Next slide. One of the things that we're attempting to do in and around drought in terms of um, what we work with in our environmental health programs in island health is looking at how we can help drinking water system operators be prepared, have within their emergency response and continuity plans what to do if they get very low or run out of water. And we do have some systems on the island that have been in that situation already, and we know, unfortunately, in the future, we will probably have more and more of that. And this was a survey we did in 2002 with our drinking water system operators to see where they're at in terms of having a water conservation plan. And about 60% of respondents did have a water conservation plan. 80% um, of those respondents said that depended on voluntary restrictions. So really, we, I mean, collectively, this is something that we're going to be needing to look at at a community level, at a water systems level. And I also just wanted to um, comment that in this um, month's Island Health magazine, we also have an article in and around this, which also says activities that people can take to help conserve water at an individual level. And in closing, I'll say um, that I'm also just really hopeful in this area around stuff that is happening in the community. Right now, we have Quashintal, uh, which is occurring, which is a walk um, tracing our steps as Cowichan people of our ancestral story, people walking from Sauk to Cowichan. People left um, early this morning, and they're going to do a four-day journey arriving in Cowichan on Sunday. Um, I will be hopefully partaking in part of that over the weekend, and it is something that Island Health had um, funded through the Community Wellness Grant Opportunity, so I really think this type of work is really going to be important for connecting us to the places we belong to and building those relationships for the challenging times we have coming ahead. So with that, I'll say hey sapka and raise my hands to all of you. Thanks very much, Shannon. You know, I, every time I hear Shannon talk, I think about how much more attention we should all pay to public health. So I really appreciate that, Shannon, thank you. And now we're going to move to a presentation on the Couch and Health and Care Plan, which aims to reduce acute care utilization through evidence-based community health programming to meet the demand for care. Our presenter is Donna Joentap, Project Director for the Couchin Health and Care Project. Plan, not project, plan. Come on, Donna. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, members of the public, and distinguished guests. 
I'm Donna Joanne Tapp, as uh, Leah said, Project Director for the Cowich and Health and Care Plan. It's an honour and a pleasure to be speaking to you today from the unceded and occupied territories of Cowich and Tribes, land on which I'm personally privileged to live, work and play every day. As part of the Cowich and Leadership Team, I'd like to acknowledge with gratitude the Cowich and Valley Indigenous communities that we serve. Cowich and Tribes, Halalt, Leaxon, Penelikits, Diminis, and our neighboring nations of Malahat, Zubaxit, Dididat, and the Métis community, who we have the opportunity to serve and work in partnership with every day. We value the opportunity to learn from all the communities and recognize these communities' progressive approach to development and community connection. I also want to thank the board and the senior leadership today for the opportunity to present this uh, health and care plan and want to send a special thank you to those of, who have supported and advocated for, for the work of the health and care plan, especially our highly dedicated frontline staff who work tirelessly, tirelessly every day to provide that excellent care to the people of the Cowich Valley. Our health and care plan was endorsed by senior leadership in 2018 as a sister project to the CDH rebuild to bridge the gap in projected service demand compared to the funded bed base of our new hospital. The underlying goal of the project is to demonstrate that strategic investment in community services can contribute to optimal census and patient flow in acute care. The health and care plan was designed using a population health needs analysis and evidence-based care model solutions. The project is considered a testing ground and an incubator model for this design methodology and models of care with a view to potentially replicate these across the island and beyond. The original target for the health and care plan was to save 32 beds a day by 2035 for acute care to match the projected demand for service. So a projection of our acute care service needs in Cowichan was completed in 2018 which is represented by the green line that you see on this graph. And it was updated with new census data. When you compare the purple line, which indicates the available bed bases that will be at our CDH to match these projections, you can see that there's quite a gap that our health and care plan has to address. Ultimately, the health and care plan has to create 44 beds of acute care avoidance by 2035 to support optimal patient flow. Here's a quick review of what we've done in the past two years with the health and care plan. The health and care plan methodology was completed in 2020 and encompassed initiatives that were already in progress as well as new initiatives identified. In 2021, Cowichan opened a new long-term care facility and its first hospice. Community health, long-term care and assisted living had worked in partnership to open a six bed steps unit for acute care clients requiring complex planning that could be done off the acute care campus. CHEP officially launched in April of 2021, and by November of 2021, our first bundle of service was launched, which was a new COPD service for the area. In 2022, the STEPS unit was expanded to 10 beds to meet demand, and additional resources were added to our community health services teams for palliative care, including an overnight LPN service, an evaluation consultant was hired to assist with the project evaluation and provide us direction, Resources were added to initiate a senior's outpatient clinic for advanced frailty assessment. And by January of 2023, we had expanded the COPD service to meet more the, the growing demand. In spring of this year, we transitioned the operational oversight of the Cowichan Hospice House from the long-term care portfolio to community health services to better align our community palliative care resources. And we have plans to implement a new model of care for palliative service in our area. The conceptual models within the CHCP methodology have been translated into operating models during a time of human resource constraint by adapting the models to fit our available resources, integrating operational models into our existing teams, and staying aligned with local and regional policies, procedures, and strategic goals. Our operational plans were created by working groups that included key stakeholders in our area, patient partners, and physicians, and ongoing partnerships have been established as a result. The health and care plan works as part of an integrated system of care and ensures that new initiatives are aligned with our home and community care, primary care network, our CDH hospital replacement team, and regional programs. 
Supporting the client through the continuum of care takes a team effort, and in Cowichan, acute and community teams meet regularly to share plans of care and transition clients safely from acute care to home and prevent readmission. As a result, the demand for community services has increased, and the community health services team has responded year over year, increasing the hours of care provided to meet this demand by up to 50% more. The health and care plan resources have been purposefully integrated into our community teams to optimize all the resources we have and increase service provided to match client needs. The strategic investment in community programming through the health and care plan is supporting acute care flow by bending the curve of demand at the CDH. Our average total length of stay has decreased by over a, patient, uh, a day per patient per admission. Our alternate level of care rates have decreased from 30% to as low as 8% this year. And overall occupancy is holding steady despite increasing demand and growing population. Acute care and CHS teams have engaged in continuous quality improvement strategies targeted at patient flow across the continuum. In 2019, community, acute, PCN, and CHCP initiatives have had a positive collective impact on ALC rates at CDH, reducing this rate from 30% down to, to, to 8. So supporting ALC patients to transition out of acute care reduces risks associated with hospital stays, such as hospital-acquired infection, while ensuring that patients needing acute care intervention will have a, bit, a bed available for them to meet their needs as well. By working together as an integrated cross-continuum team supported by the CHCP resources, Cowichan has been able to maintain an average hospital occupancy of 97% capacity in the past several months. In addition, Cowichan was able to accomplish this within an environment of a higher population to acute bed ratio as noted in the original CHCP analysis, which stated that the Cowichan Valley has fewer beds per thousand population as compared to communities of similar size, yet it has a higher rate of inpatient utilization than Island Health or BC, suggesting a high operational efficiency and poor health status. So how are we doing compared to our target so far? Our corporate data from 22-23 shows that the average bed utilization at CDH was 141 beds, which equates to 16 beds a day saved compared to what we were anticipating needing. When placed into the context of the CHCP original projection, you can see that the bed utilization is even less than the target that we were given to match demand, so Cowichan is bending the curve and well on track to keep CDH functioning at optimal capacity. To date, the health and care plan has received an investment of $3.7 million. Um, we've endeavored to limit this investment required by integrating our new resources into existing teams and optimize our service delivery, maximize efficiency, and create strong connections between teams to build the area integrated model up. Success in recruiting has happened despite our pandemic and HR constraints with 50% of our first staff hire being recruited external to Island Health, which was a big win for us. Um, we're completing our year two of a 15-year conceptual plan. We know we have much more work to do, but in year one and two, we've exceeded our bed savings target, and we're demonstrating success with the methodology and the evidence-based approach that this plan provides. This year, Health and Care Plan will have achieved 16 beds a day towards our target of 21 beds by 2026. In terms of a quick calculation of cost versus value, the total bed day saved for health and care plans since we started is 10,369. If you look at the cost of a hospital bed on average being $925 a day, this equates to $9.6 million in cost savings. We also want to point out that not all new funding in Cowichan has come through health and care plan. We've been working with partners such as the Division of Family Practice and UBC to pool funds to contribute to our collective impact enabled in enabled by our integrated structure and connection. Health and care plan is filling gaps in service and contributing to a strengthened network of care. So here are some highlights of our health and care plan to date. As far as awards go, we've been uh, really fortunate to be um, recognized by a national award, the 3M award for steps. Uh, we've been uh, awarded with an Island Health Award for our COPD program, and we've been invited to talk to two conferences this spring. 
Our COPD team has the highest referral and, and visit activity on the island and continuous process improvement has resulted in action plans, which are a key element of self-care for, for patients, being in place within two weeks of referral to the team. Our preliminary findings show that there's a reduction in acute care utilization for COPD patients, and it is no longer in the top five admission diagnosis at CDH as it was when we started. As mentioned earlier, our ALC rates have dropped, and CHCP has saved over 10,000 beds, and which equals 16 beds a day. You've heard that already. Um, palliative care, we're seeing a 22% increase in visits to support people in the last 12 weeks of their lives. Our overnight nursing team supports patients in their final days, sometimes 24-7 if required. And what we see now is a 50% reduction in hospital deaths for palliative patients being followed by the CHS team. So we're reducing death in hospital for that crowd. For our seniors outpatient clinic, the wait time for our geriatric physician assessment has reduced from over six months now down to two. So targeted evidence-based investment in community services in Cowichan is supporting patient flow through our continuum of care. As we continue our health and care plan journey, knowing that there will be additional pressures and demands while we wait for the new hospital to open its doors, we're proposing to take further steps to create more acute care avoidance. This year, we plan to reimagine our palliative care services in the area. This will include opening the remaining beds at hospice to meet demand and implementing a new model of care which will focus on hospice as a central hub of care for our palliative clients. And secondly, we're going to look at enhancing connection to community services to make sure people can get the services they need where they need it and this will help them to avoid unnecessary hospitalization and support discharge earlier from hospital. We're going to do this through active community inreach into our emergency departments and by implementing a hospital at home program in Cowichan. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donna. Normally I would turn to the board and ask if they had questions of Donna, but we had the pleasure of spending time with you earlier today, so this is truly a program for patients. So thank you for um, bringing it to us and doing such a good job with it. And now I welcome a community presentation from the Village Project, which provides housing to the unsheltered. To hear more about this project, I'm delighted to introduce Dean Bergstrom, the project manager for It Takes a Village. Thank you and hello. Uh, I'm Dean Bergstrom, manager of the Village Project. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here today to present. Um, yeah, get close. Um, I guess we'll get right into it. The next slide, please. The village has been formed. It uh, took a couple different um, uh, steps along the way. It had began uh, as a COVID relief uh, project where it was first tenting and then moved on to the tiny homes on St. Julian and at the Mount. Uh, it then, uh, with partnership with CHA and the community action team, uh, funded by the UBCM grant. Uh, we have to thank Mayor Staples for helping put all this together. It was very good uh, steps along the way. Um, we have been operating under a temporary use permit uh, that we've had to apply for a couple times and thankfully we got extended. We're uh, yeah on the same site. It's BC Housing has stepped in since that. That was since December of last year. Um, next. Uh, it's definitely the village is a, a partnership between the entire community and the village itself is a community. Uh, we've found tremendous success uh, with uh, the stakeholders, community partners and different service providers in the Couchin Valley. Um, yeah, CHA, the City of Duncan and North Couchin, uh, Couchin Community Action Team, the RCMP, uh, Couchin Tribes and House of Friendship have been absolutely phenomenal with, with the assistance that, that they've given throughout this time. Uh, the, the donations we've received through Little Caesars, uh, Starbucks, uh, Clement Center has been helpful with, with uh, putting the site together and of course Island Health. Uh, the teams, the Sioux Team Act and Public Health Outreach has been uh, 
uh, vital to the success of the, the village and the people who reside there. Next, please. So it's a community-based program uh, that's 24-7 support, housing to 34 people at a time. Uh, next, please. And basically, the, the demographics reflect what is happening on the streets, which is it's quite shocking to see that, that there is a uh, over-representation of Indigenous peoples, and we work together to, to try to provide as much support as we can uh, with Couch and Tribes and House of Friendship. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this, the selection process has gone through it's, uh, the community coordinated access, uh, which is a, a collection of all the service providers within the Couch and Valley that get together and basically we put forward those who are highest at risk. Uh, they're chosen uh, on the VAT score, which is usually a number th uh, three to reflect the, the highest risk in the community. Next, please. So when people move on to the site, um, they're fully furnished. We provide all the, the different um, uh, beds, bedding, mattresses, an armoire, some tables, uh, uh, two stools, and and within the site, there's all sorts of different stuff. Uh, there's the the garden, community areas, and uh, and some of the programs we provide on site. The bathrooms and showers on site. Uh, it, the site is split into three different sections, and within those three sections, there's a uh, washroom. Uh, sort of a building which houses three separate um, toilets and two showers, and each one of these is sep are accessed separately. It has their own locking door, so it's not the community, um, just your, your basic washroom, shared washroom. Uh, we offer on-site laundry, and that was thanks to a donation from Couch and Tribes, uh, again, as well. Um, and we, we provide the bedding, towels, housewarming, um, soaps, everything that we can uh, through donations from Soap for Hope which uh, they, they work with hotels and motels to, to supply different stuff throughout the, all the communities. Uh, next slide, please. So the meals are provided by uh, CGC, and they, they uh, supply the breakfast and dinner daily. Um, it's a food recovery program, which I believe we calculated out to, to be 30 tons of waste has been, been saved from hitting our landfills. Uh, lunches are provided by various donations, um, House of Friendship, has brought by some just amazing uh, setups. Their, their lunches and snacks are, are next level. People very, really appreciate them. Uh, but like I said earlier, Starbucks, Little Caesars, and uh, local churches and community groups have got together for holidays and special occasions and, and brought us a lot of nice things too. Uh, next, please. So look out uh, staff. We have shelter resource workers available during the day. We have two on at a time. And at night, we have uh, building attendants, which are trained as well. But uh, we played, replaced security about uh, nine months in. Uh, we felt that it would be more appropriate to have staff available and, and trained to work with people, um, as opposed to uh, security being on site, which, which uh, yeah, it's been a, a marked improvement. Uh, people are more comfortable coming up and, and uh, approaching staff, approaching the staff unit. Uh, Corelli and myself, she's the coordinator at the site. Um, we're available 24-7, we're always on call, so it can be a little tasking at times. Um, and peer workers. Peer workers are available 24-7, and that's uh, anything from, from supporting staff uh, with community cleanup, walks, uh, site cleanup, um, basically supporting of staff. Uh, next, slide, next slide, please. Um, staff are, are trained and, and do utilize case planning for each and every uh, one of the site residents uh, on an individual basis, trying to form the, you know, whatever case plan we can, which uh, will reflect what the goals are of each individual on site. It's been uh, very, it's been quite amazing actually to see the difference that this has made. Um, we've had several individuals that we've worked with for years who have made incredible improvements in uh, socializing, family life, uh, getting back to work as well, which I'll touch on in a minute. Uh, next, please. One in five people at the village have attended detox or treatment. And I feel like I'm repeating myself, but it's thanks once again to Couch and Tribes and the efforts with, with their staff uh, and the relationship that's been formed. Um, they've made it really possible for us to, to access treatment in a quick and effective manner. And there's been success with the people attending to as well. 
public health is is and uh, suit and act actually they've been helpful with referring and and working with our people to to improve the access to to detoxing treatment as well next please uh, this is just a statement from one of our, our folks and uh, a picture of the gardening program one of them that we've had but uh, basically just a lot of these follow the same lines it's just basically the ability to to have a home, have a, uh, a platform to, to actually step off of and move in a direction where they've wanted to and we provide the ability for that. And this is multi-layered, multi, um, but, but basically the, the housing first is the, the main reason this is working so well. It, it's people are given the ability to, to use a washroom, to have a shower, to engage with each other on a healthy and positive uh, way there's been um, so much movement with with people uh, we've seen people who hadn't literally reached or reached out or, or spoken to other service providers or ourselves in years have just blossomed come out of their shells and and it's it's an amazing thing to see we're, we're super proud of the, the work that's happened and, and the progress that the people have made um, family is is it's beautiful the way that the site is set up and operated um, the the logistics of the site couldn't have been better the entranceway with available parking for, for both service providers, um, family, friends to come and visit and basically just interact with each other and, and provide support for each other. Uh, next please. Uh, was spoken about earlier was the extreme weather. We have set up on the, the left hand side, you can see we have a pergola and a, a tent set up and, and each one of the, like I described, um, there's three different living sections on each one of the, uh, for each one of the pods we call them I guess. Um, each one of the living sections has the shaded areas, but one specifically in the in the extreme heat, we get a sprinkler hose and we've we've created our own cooling stations within. Um, seeing as there's uh, no outside guests allowed within the living sections, this is contained to the 34 people who live on site. Uh, in the winter, BC Housing was good enough to um, give us some uh, extra support uh, as we had found that the the living units were a little on the cold side and there's a baseboard heater included with each one, but we found that people were, were uh, communicating to us that, that it was a little bit on the cold side. So we um, got some spray foam insulation and started to seal up the windows, the doors, and any cracks and, and areas and, and found it, uh, I think a six degree difference it, it made with a very little investment. So it's, it worked out very well for us. Next please. The community spaces, like I was just describing with the, uh, the tents and, and the picnic tables and whatnot, uh, there's a fridge on each living section uh, as well as the, the gathering spots. Um, it provides meeting space for, for the providers to come and connect with the, 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 the people who live there, but also it creates an environment in which people are interacting with each other in a healthy and positive way. Um, it's a, the whole site has been set up like the like like I said the, the logistics of it couldn't have been more perfect with the entrance and exits and the way that people have to to basically interact and and it just created a, a, a positive place for people to to form their own community and the village name could not be much better for it as well because people take such pride and and uh, put so much effort into the 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 layout of the site like as you see a lot of the the rocks the the gardens and whatnot have been created by peers and by the people who live on site staff assists and and we assist in in building and and but a lot of the maintenance and everything is done on site and that's a, a pride of place that's created from people enjoying their home and and knowing that they have a place to sleep and and being proud of where they live next please so with this touches to island health's effect and impact on the site. Um, public health has been super helpful with getting people to appointments, getting people uh, to wound care, to emergency if necessary. But but what this has also uh, resulted from their visits and and their their care of our people has greatly reduced the number of hospital visits, the the need for emergency emergency care. It's like maintenance and and preventive. Um, work that they're doing and it's been fantastic. I believe we had uh, 15,000 visits altogether to the site, 75% of the visits to that site 
make up uh, what public health has done on site, or, or health and wellness, and that would include ACT and SUD and, as that as well, which they're on site multiple times a day. Um, we average about 30 visits to the site per day from external service providers, and, and uh, that's the majority is with Island Health. Um, so this clearly shows, though, the difference in, in the ability to access healthcare and the ability to take care of oneself. And, and that comes from a lot of different things. Uh, the advocating that comes from the Island Health teams to uh, reduce the, the, the fear of people entering places where they, they had previously felt unsafe. Um, it, it has really helped to reduce stigma and stereotyping as well um, with uh, the, the relationship formed between everybody. Next, please. Uh, yeah, I touched on this, that 75% that of the visits to site are health and wellness. And the programs, donations, security make up the rest, uh, family and social connection. Um, these are all like a huge part of what makes the village itself. Um, the ability for people to, to come onto site and, and meet up with their family, friends, and then to go from there or to be, to be uh, treated as an individual uh, meeting up with healthcare providers or, or uh, different, different supports such as uh, Couch and Tribes and House of Friendship come and we do a lot of different, um, different events. There's been ceremony, the, the opening ceremony was actually um, provided by, by Couch and Tribes and, and House of Friendship and, and uh, but since then we've had unfortunate losses in the community um, Couch and Tribes showed up and, and actually uh, we did a, a, a ceremony and, and a sharing circle in which everybody participated and, and just the, the impact of that was unbelievable. It was, it was um, probably one of, the, one of the best memories I've had since we opened just about a year and a half ago now. Uh, next slide, please. And another statement by one of our residents, uh, just speaking to the health improvements that since moving into site. Um, yeah, we've, we've done a lot of surveys and a lot of different um, uh, uh, statements that we've collected throughout the time and it's, it's heartwarming to see what people have to say and what their beliefs are since they've been on site and got to experience uh, stability and, and care. Next, please. Uh, speaking to the cultural uh, safety that's we uh, and the surveys that we have done, this has been something that, that we've put a lot of care and time into and planning and, and what, one of the things is that, that I can speak to that, that we're really proud of is, is the relationships that we've uh, formed throughout being with Lookout Housing and Health Society. Um, the majority of us have been with other uh, uh, service providers within the Valley, but with, since 2021, we've been in the Couch of Valley as Lookout Housing and Health Society and we've fostered these relationships and, and developed them and, and this is one of the, the points that we really want to, to make sure that everybody feels safe at the village, regardless of, of where they come from, what they identify as, or what, wh where they've been. Their past is their past. It's new coming to the village. Next, please. The peer programs. So Lookout Housing and Health Society uh, has a peer program that we offer at the village and at the overdose prevention site. And this uh, peer program, it's a peer work program where we actually onboard them and we're able to help uh, build resumes, we're able to, uh, to work with people, that there's staff support, there's all sorts of stuff that comes along with it. And what this looks like at the village is a lot of people go out and collect garbage, pick up sharps if necessary, respond to community concerns, um, and as well as they help with cleaning, the gardening, the building of the gardens and, and whatnot. And that's 29% of the current residents are actually employed with this program. And that's, yeah, we assist getting identification, the bank account, all the necessary things, uh, fill out the applications. And so they're actually a lookout employee at this point. And that's 29%. Uh, so, and then, so next please. So the Street Smart Outreach, that uh, has been around, I, it's missing me the original where I come from, but the Couch and Community Action Team uh, was operating this when we opened site and 88% of our current residents participate and this is another one of the low barrier uh, outreach and anti-stigma programs. It, um, it really centers on uh, collection of garbage, uh, sharps pickup, 
um, responding to overdose if, um, if and when they come across it. Um, they actually do Narcan training for people, their, their peers and whatnot. Um, the community uh, feedback that we've received about these programs, it's, it's quite astonishing where there were as vocal opponents of the site when we, when we first arrived in the neighborhood and the, the, the individual who was actually um, concerned about us being there actually had stated that he missed seeing them as the program slowed down a little bit in the, the severe winter. Um, being out, no, out and about is, you know, it did, uh, did a little slow down over the winter, but we sped back up and things are back on as, as we go. Um, they do travel more so outside of our area where we are responsible for 150 meters uh, lookout is of our site. That's uh, part of the temporary use permit, but um, the Street Smart Outreach, they're able to, to basically travel wherever they need to or want to be in the city and uh, two people go out at a time and they spend two hours. Um, they go down to sites like the overdose prevention site or they'll go towards casino along the river. Um, it's up to them and, and it's, it's a uh, very low barrier program and it's really provided a lot of uh, self-worth, pride and confidence in a lot of the folks who, who reside at the village. Next please. So lookout uh, staff that are on site, they are fully trained. We, we do um, provide training within lookout after being, being onboarded, but um, nonviolent crisis intervention being, being super important. Um, for first aid, overdose response, incident response, um, peer support and local resources. And we, we pride ourselves on trauma-informed communication. Um, and what the combination of the peer programs and our staff have, have contributed to within is, is a huge decrease in the negativity and the, the opposition to the actual site itself. Uh, there was a large petition that was created uh, when this was going through city council for the first time and that uh, we've done recent, um, recent canvassing of the area and there's a very low number of people who are opposed to the site itself being where we are now as well as the reasons why they're opposed to it, none related directly to the site. It was, it was pretty great to hear that. Uh, next, please. So this speaks to the community being, being uh, a lot more positive about the area. We, um, we take seriously the 150 meter radius of the site. Uh, staff are monitoring it hourly. They go do walks supported by the peer programs. Um, and anybody that's loitering, littering, uh, openly using substances, and uh, in people's business frontages, residents, uh, residential properties, whatnot, um, we encourage them to, to move along. We engage with them and, and uh, provide different options, uh, different sites and services that are open, as well as other places within the city that, that it's acceptable to be at the time and they're not gonna get moved along again. Um, we've provided our site phone to uh, all the businesses and residents around that area and ensure that we're responsive when, when there is an issue or if there's any concerns or whatnot. Uh, next, please. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it speaks to the, the rules that we have there. We, we do uh, have a program participation agreement and within that program participa uh, participation agreement, it contains uh, the crime-free addendum and a good neighbor agreement. And this uh, basically increases the accountability of, of both ourselves and of the people who, who live on site. Um, it took a bit of time, but people actually um, have come forward and communicated that they're actually pleased that we do have uh, the level of accountability that we do hold people to on site. Um, people are, are more likely to police the site itself even. Uh, they'll come forward, which is not very typical working with uh, the population we do. Um, but there's an increased comfort with sharing with uh, staff and with management if there is a concern or, or if there's something that needs to be brought up and knowing that their confidentiality is not gonna be compromised or that you know there's not gonna be judgment or whatnot with it. But it's, it's really a, a great sign that that, uh, that is something that has come about due to the, the staff's interaction, the trust and relationships built between ourselves and the people who reside on site. This once again is, has reduced crime in our two micro areas that the site and our 150 meter radius span. Uh, the walks and the interaction, the engagement, and the, the people on site. 
the people who are living on site have really contributed to and and uh, really influenced and motivated uh, their associates, friends, and people who are in the area, like really that the site exists solely uh, based on on uh, public, you know, acceptance and and uh, their ability to to keep the place uh, safer and and more welcoming. Uh, their, their neighborhood and, and community safer and, uh, and cleaner, right? Um, the cleaning of the area, and we, we keep uh, quite a lot of different statistics and data, and, and I believe it was in the first month that we started doing the, the walks in the community that we found 90% uh, less disturbances in the area. The garbage collection, it, um, it actually created less garbage in the area. The more we would collect and more we would clean up, we'd find less and less garbage that we'd have to clean up. So it's been a, a, a really great experience to, to be there and to develop this, this, um, this protocol where, where staff and, and both people living on site are able to go out and, and contribute and be seen being uh, assistive in the, in the community. Next, please. Yeah, the canvassing results I touched on, uh, it was a 90% positive. Um, we, we did a 200 meter radius of the site, and, and like I said, none of the negative comments were related directly to the program or the site itself. Next, please. We've had several visitors from several different communities. Um, we've been reached out to all across BC. Um, we've had uh, a community in, in Ontario reach out and to see what it is that makes the village the success that it is. And our answer is literally uh, relationship building and and uh, community, and that includes all the different uh, service providers, the, the the partners within the city. It's Duncan is really blessed for that reason to have a, a whole lot of different people who who are willing to work together and to, to you know build a site and and support a site like the village. Um, we've had municipal councils from Duncan, North Couchin, Courtney, Comox, Parksville, Qualicum, and Camel River, and Victoria, uh, Nanaimo in there too. Um, all people have come and expressed an interest in creating a site that's similar to the village and uh, walked away with a, a really good idea of what it takes. We were open sharing what does work and what doesn't. Uh, next, please. Yeah, that's, uh, so that'll wrap it up. Um, in a nutshell, the, really, the, the village is a, it's, a, its own small community which resides within another community. Uh, we're super proud of the work that's happened and the partnerships developed and the relationships that have been formed. Uh, it couldn't exist without it and it would not have the success that it does without that. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Dean, and thank you for your enthusiasm and commitment. Um, it's lovely to see all the partners that you've developed, and there's no doubt in my mind, and I'm sure the minds of the boards, that you understand partnership better than most people. So thank you very much for that. Thank you all for being here. We're getting very close to closing time, I'm afraid. Um, as a board and an organization, we deeply value our community partnerships. So I appreciate you coming today and for the great work you're doing in your community. I do want to take a minute, though, and just ask if there are any questions from the audience. Okay, well, whoops. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And also, I was wondering um, about the sleeping pods that had been used previously on Ypres Street and at the mound, and then they were put actually back here. Are they, were they not able to be reused in another location? Are you aware of that? That's not to do with you. That's couch and housing. So that would be a general different question than they there were sleeping pods I think there might have been about 35 I see they're down to 14 I hear they've been being sold and I didn't know if they were reusable in another possible situation to augment what you're busy doing and then my one other question would be how temporary is temporary with the village it seems to keep being extended so is there a long-term plan or would you know that yet
Okay, thank you. And the reason I ask those questions, my name's Joyce Benson. and I'm with Life on Wheels. We're an, a street outreach, and uh. we've been doing that for over two and a half years, meeting with homeless and addicted people, wanting to help and serve and meet their oh, needs. I see. And that's been very positive, but just to direct them to the opportunity for a place to stay would be very helpful. All thank right. you for all that's happening. Thank you very much. I want to um, just thank a few people who helped us get this together. So over in the corner there is Lisa, our board liaison, who greeted you when you came in this morning. And I want to thank uh, Jamie Brayman and his team of um, Mike and Tyler. And in particular, I want to thank the multimedia group for being here and always helping us with our sound and our recordings and all kinds of things that they do for us. So thank you, everybody. Thank you to my colleagues on the board and to Kathy. I hope this has been a productive afternoon for you all. Thank you. <laughs>